McMillan, sports Washington Redskins editor for the Washington Post, and Scott Allen, also of the UC Sports Blog. Guys, we have a lot to get to today. Obviously, off the top, it's going to be Redskins. We'll talk a little Adrian Peterson announced today that he's been suspended without pay. Wizards starting 7-2. and two. Bradley Beal practices yesterday for the first time. The Capitals have been up and down, up and down. They're three points out of a playoff spot now, about a quarter of the way into the season. We hit that. And then college basketball, a great weekend for all locals. Um, we'll discuss that too. But off the top, as usual, let's see, RG, three minutes. Boy, where to start with the Robert Griffin drama? It seems like every week there's something new, right? This time, he's there's been comments that he's thrown his teammates under the bus by saying, you know, we can't look in the sit in front of a locker and say, I'm a ball, I'm a Pro Bowl player, we have no Pro Bowl players. He goes out, throws two picks in the first half that lead to 10 points against Tampa Bay in that 27-7 loss. I guess the question I have for you, Dan, is do you, is RG3 the man for the future, given how poorly he's played the last couple of games and the fact that Colt McCoy went to Dallas and beat the Cowboys? Well, I mean, I think we can stop with the Colt McCoy. I mean, Colt, <laughs> oh, yeah. Colt, Colt McCoy is not the future. I would assume that we all agree on yeah. that. You know what? I think about RG3, I think... Four days ago, we were all saying you got to let him play the next six, seven games, and then you decide at the end of the year. Obviously, he played terribly against Tampa Bay. He did everything wrong against Tampa Bay. But I don't think that changes what we all thought four or five days ago, which is that you let him play the next six or seven games, then you decide at the end of the year if he's the guy. And, you know, against Minnesota, he certainly did enough to have the Redskins win. Against Tampa Bay, he certainly didn't. But um, you've put a lot into this, not just the three years, but you've also put a lot of draft picks and a lot of resources into this. I don't think you give up after one bad game. Heath, did, did RG3 do the right thing by saying what he said in, in post game? I mean, what he said, I think, made sense, but has he earned the right to be that guy to say, well, we need everyone else to play better, like Tom Brady does all the time? Uh, I don't know if he's earned that right, but I think if you listen to his quotes in context, I, I think he was actually trying to, to, his very first quotes were, I didn't play well enough. And that's losing, and losing in the fashion sure. that they lose. No. I, 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 I think we're kind of, we are being kind of rough on, on him because I think he's trying to do the right thing. And he's obviously not playing well, and the worse you play, the more scrutiny you're going to get. You know, get. Like for real, and I, I hate to say this because I love social media, and it's a huge part of my job, but yeah. he has never helped himself on no. social yeah. media. Agreed, that, I mean, agreed. And like even yesterday, like the going back and forth between Deshaun Jackson and RG3 on social media, and right. it's just, you're just opening up more questions well, than these. Maybe guys, you let's, should take a page from Aaron Rodgers and just tweet out, relax, and leave it at well, that. Let's, we let's, can let's, just, let's just move on. For, we'll, we'll talk about social media because... Jay Gruden addressed the Instagram hubbub with, with Deshaun Jackson. And, and, but you look at the coaching in that game, okay? The play that stood out to me, and I was talking to Keith about this in, uh, when I was blogging about the game, Mike Evans was left one-on-one -on -one with Perry Riley Jr. How does that happen on the back end? If you're Jim Hazlitt, how do you design a defense where Mike Evans is left one-on-one -on -one with a linebacker? So that leads to my question with, do any of the coaches, we're talking about Jay Gruden, the, the offensive coordinator, the defensive coordinator, special teams, missed two field goals from Kai Forbath, do any of those guys deserve to be retained for next season? Or who are you keeping? <laughs> I mean, are you keeping Jay Gruden? I know it's a, but honestly, they hired a new special teams coach to make it better. Has it been better? Jim has it. You cannot have a linebacker one-on-one -on -one with Mike Evans. That's like, a, to me, a fireable offense. How does that happen? Well, the, you know, the explanation for that was that Perry Riley was actually supposed to blitz the A-gap yeah. on that play and that Keenan Robinson was, was supposed to drop back and, and he wouldn't have had to cover Mike Evans for very long had the, had the uncovered A-gap blitz gotten home. Um, as far as answering the question about the coaches, though, you, you brought in part of the reason the Redskins are so bad is because they, they constantly churn. They're always trying to restart back from the beginning and then, you, and then you know, they, they're... I don't think you can you can get rid of Gruden, McVeigh, or or Katuka after this season. You know it hasn't been good, um, but you got to give the the, the, chan the guys a chance to teach, to find out who can play for them and who can't. Right. And uh, you know to to pull the plug after one year, unless you're so bad that you know it's never going to work and that that everybody in the locker room's already lost confidence in you. You know that's when you pull the plug right away. But other than that, you got to let let them have a chance to build. I'm going to throw that to you, Dan. But uh, let me let me give you an example of the Cleveland Browns. Mike Pettin his first year. Kyle Shanahan coordinator first year with Brian Hoyer as a quarterback. Yeah. No Josh Gordon. Ben Tate's been hurt. Look what they're doing. Well, so it can wait, be done. I think, I Why think let's wait until the end of the season before we okay, crown okay, the Cleveland Browns? No, okay, I'm not, but, I'm, but did anyone expect them to have the record they have now at this point in the season, regardless? I mean, I'm, I don't disagree but, with you. Uh, I mean, probably not. But they're they're like what six and four? Yeah. I mean, let's not. The, have any what are the Redskins? Three and seven? Okay, they're, they're, Who has I'm, more talent? Who has more talent on the on the up and down the roster? 
Well, I who has more I, playmakers? I, I, I don't know the answer to that question. Oh, I, I don't know the answer to that question. You're saying that Andrew Hawkins and, and their wide receivers are as good as Deshaun Jackson and, and I mean, Deshaun, Garçon. Yeah, no, I but, don't but know Cleveland the answer does have a better Do they defense. have Alfred Morris? Cleveland does have more talent on defense than, than the Redskins okay, have. And, okay, fair. And, but part of what Mike Patton had to try to do was, was change the culture, and, and that's kind of what Jay Gruden's trying to do here, and it's not working very well right now. Scott, do you, what, what are your thoughts on, on the coaching staff? I mean, if you look at the basic numbers, points per game, uh, 22nd, opponents' points per game, 24th, that we've talked about how terrible the special, special teams are all year. I yeah. mean, none of these coaches deserve to come back. But I think to Keith's point, I think the three that he mentioned, uh, Gruden, McVeigh, and Kajwika, should come back for purpose of continuity. If there's one guy who's, we have a track record that at, at this point of knowing that he is a, a liability. I mean, Mike Evans providing 207 more reasons on Sunday why Jim Hazlitt should not be here next year. I think he's got to be gone and you got to rebuild around the guys that you have. But well, here's a more general question uh, in terms of the front office and Bruce Allen. How much do you put on him for, for, for giving Hazlitt not enough talent in the back end? We know they don't have it in the back end. Their offensive line has been a disaster. Now that Trent Williams is hurt, who knows what's going to happen? Is that on him? Yeah, yeah. Can I? I mean, I, I think absolutely he has to. I think Bruce Allen has to own the majority of what's going on right now. I think because, and it's not even. I mean, people talk about Deshaun Jackson as the great success story, and you're over here singing his praises too. He's played yeah, well, yes. but I think that is that what they needed. You know, Pierre Garçon had a record-setting season but last he's not, year. He doesn't stretch the field the way Deshaun does. Well, how, how is Deshaun Jackson helping that record then? Well, it wasn't his fault that he was seven. overthrown three times by Robert Griffin III. I'm just III. saying why there, there were so many needs on this team, and wide receiver, to me, was not near the top yeah. of the no, list. Offensive, that was agree. The offensive, offensive line, line. certainly. And the, the guard that they brought in from Cleveland has not been good. The, the Ryan Clark thing is not working out. I no. mean, I think that Bruce Allen right now has to own this as much as anyone in that organization. Yeah, and, and also the money they spent on, on Arakpo. Yeah, there you go. Well, but you're not, but Dan Snyder, has Dan Snyder ha, has, has never had a track record of getting a real GM in here. And that's, I don't know if that's going to change under his ownership because he wants a guy who's going to, you know, be the rah-rah guy and play golf with him. Is he going to get a guy that's a real GM? I mean, do you foresee that happening? And he's still going to want the guy who makes the big splash. Yeah. I mean, Deshaun Jackson's going to sell tickets yes, like an offensive is. lineman is not, but then you get to three and seven and you realize that even Deshaun Jackson on a losing team is going to lead to scenes like we saw Sunday. I mean, when you see Robert Griffin overthrow the fastest player in the NFL, I mean, wh what are you thinking to yourself? I mean, I'm not saying Deshaun Jackson <clears throat> justified in posting that Instagram, Instagram garbage, but still, I mean, he was wide open on three plays. You got to hit at least one of those that could change the tenor of the game. Anyway. Okay, well, you know what? I, I don't I, disagree with you, but it's I, not like that doesn't happen all over the league. Right. We saw, no, what, yeah, Teddy no, Bridgewater, saying, saw okay. what Teddy Bridgewater did. He no. overthrew. Uh, uh, but RG3 is not Teddy Bridgewater. He's not a rookie quarterback. That's the difference. Okay, uh, let's just let's move on to the, the, the Redskins' next game against San Francisco. And we're talking about this <laughs> beforehand, how... Who knows what happens in the NFL, right? Would anyone be surprised if they went in there and played them tough? Or maybe even, God forbid, won that game. But let's God we're forbid. talking about bold position. God forbid. What are you <laughs> right. about? You know, because they can't beat Tampa Bay at home. How do we think they're going to go to San Francisco and win that game? But Which is why we have bold predictions, Dan. What is yours for that game? You know, we've, we've seen so many different special teams things go wrong this year. I, I mean, just in so many different facets. And the two missed field goals... Uh, Sunday were the latest, but I think they still have another trick up their sleeve. I think they will find a new special teams disaster to break out. <laughs> oh, maybe like a, I don't, I don't think we've had a blocked punt return for a touchdown this year yet, right? They, they got a punt blocked well, in, they did against a punt. Houston. Houston. Yeah, it was that return for a touchdown? Okay, though. Though. okay well, I, you know, I, I just think that we're gonna we're gonna have another special teams fiasco of some sort in San Francisco. Maybe that's not bold because it seems to happen yeah, almost every yeah. week, but that's what I think is gonna happen. I thought the bold part was gonna be that like Andre Roberts was gonna take one <laughs> no. to the house. Or something, <laughs> that, right? would, that, that would, would be, be bold. Exactly. No, I don't think so. But maybe Andre. Roberts goes in when San Francisco's returning a punt, returns one the other direction or something. But not nah, it's going to be something bad. Do you see anything out of the ordinary happen in this game, Keith? I, I, do, I do see um, Washington's offense playing a lot better. Yeah. Um, I, you know, they, they've had, with Griffin, they, they have six points against Houston, seven points against Tampa Bay, and then they have 26 against Minnesota. That was the game where they scored enough to win. And I think right now we're seeing um, the inconsistency from week to week with this offense and also with uh, with Robert Griffin the third, they they try to get the running game going. It works for a half. They go away from it in the second half. So I think they'll. My, my bold prediction is that they'll score 21 in San Francisco. It won't be enough to win, but it'll be enough to make us question for another week. Basically saying we still don't have the answer. Scott, are you are, are you willing to say the Redskins are going to score a huge upset this weekend, or you're not going that far? Uh, they provided no reason to believe <laughs> on Sunday that they can even be zero, competitive absolutely zero, cover right. the seven and a half, eight point spread, yeah. whatever it is in San Francisco. But yeah, I'm going to say 
they go into San Francisco and they win. And one of the main reasons I say that is that the 49ers have a huge game coming up um, against Seattle the following Thursday, right. like a short week Thanksgiving yeah. Day game against their big rivals. Um, we've already seen San Francisco lose at home to St. Louis, and St. Louis has been kind of a giant slayer in the NFL this year. Yeah. Um, bad against the bad teams, but really good against the, the heavyweights. So, yeah, I say the Redskins go in and, and pull off the upset. Well, well, we'll obviously have plenty of time to revisit that next week, but now on to the news of the day. Adrian Peterson suspended without pay for the rest of the season. I'm going to ask you guys each to play general manager here for a second. If you were building a team for next season, do you want Adrian Peterson on roster? Scott, I'll start with you. Uh, I would want Adrian Peterson on my roster. Um, I may not play him next year, yeah. but as a guy, I mean, that depends on what Roger Goodell decides to do, of course. But yeah, I think he's a guy who's still football-wise in the prime of his career. Uh, he's kind of a not a once in a generation back, but he I think is a premier yeah, running close. back in yeah. the league. Sure. Um, and despite um, people will throw out words like toxic yep. um, to describe him, yeah, I, I want him on my team. How about you, Keith? I, I would say yes. It depends on the team. If it's a team that's already pretty close to, to winning, you know, I don't think you bring him into a situation like Washington, for example, <laughs> where you don't have a, a lot of structure. You're not yeah. close to winning the Super Bowl. Uh, but if you have a team that's already pretty good and you need a running back, we, it's been proven that, that we'll give sports heroes a second chance yeah. if they're good enough. Uh, you know, Michael Vick, Kobe Bryant, yeah. uh, you know, the, in, the, in the baseball steroid scandals, the yeah. guys who stood up in right. front of the camera, uh, you know, Andy Pettit and Jason Giambi, and said, I, I did it, I'm sorry, it went away for them. And the guys who fought it and, and didn't handle it right publicly, um, you know, it lingered. And so if Adrian Peterson takes the right approach, from here on out, uh, I, I think we'll, fans will be willing to give him a second chance, and that's the door to, for a team to, to open up and let, let them bring him back in. Well, Dan, are, are, as a GM, are you prepared to handle the PR <coughs> nightmare that's going to accompany signing Adrian Peterson, or is that not worth it for you? I mean, again, I think it sure depends if you need a running back right. or not. But I don't – I mean, at some point you have to say this is the punishment from the legal system, this is the punishment from Roger Goodell, whether yeah. it's too long, whether it's too short, whatever. But when the punishment is over – if no one's going to give him a job anyhow, then the punishment isn't really what you're announcing the punishment is. Then the punishment is like a lifetime sentence. You know, I, I think a lot of this probably comes down to your feelings on corporal punishment, um, yeah. which is like a really personal issue. You know, it's, it, we're, we're parents here. And I, yeah. Obviously, it's not something that I, I think the vast majority of parents would feel comfortable with. But I, it just, to me, it comes down to if he serves the punishment that has been set up by the legal system and by the NFL... I don't know how you can really deny him ever a chance to work again. That doesn't well, seem fair to let, me. Let me throw this out there, Keith, to you. Is there any similarities between what's going on with Adrian Peterson and what's going on with Ray Rice? Because they're both, they're both not playing right now, and they're both running backs that I think so many teams would like to have on their roster. Well, and they're both people who are accused of abusing yes, an, abuse, another human being. Uh, yes, And right. both people who were widely considered, you know, totally stand-up guys. That, that's, before that's, the, yeah. Uh, yeah. So. yeah, you know, the, the, the difference may be that, that Peterson is a, is a superhuman talent. Yeah. Ray Rice is a pretty good running back, yeah. and you may see Peterson get another job, and you may see Ray Rice uh, never get another NFL job. Well, could you see Adrian Peterson, for example, on New England? I mean, imagine if he went there. I mean, that's 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 the that's place the where where players would get second, third chances. Look at Randy Moss. Uh, they did Scott, it with is Corey, that a scenario that Corey maybe possible? Could that could that could that be possible in the NFL if we saw Adrian Peterson go to New England? Would, would you think that Belichick would take a chance on him? Sure, I think he would. I mean, we talked about it when we were when we were talking about the Ray Rice uh, suspension. Yeah. I, I mentioned New England as a possibility there, and throw him in that. Uh, in that lineup, I think he would welcome the chance. I, I just, the, the PR hit though that you take, you know, it, you know it's at the first game of the season, there's going to be protests, sure. there's going to be media all over you. You just, I think what you said, Keith, was right, hit the nail on the head. I mean, you, you, he's not going to Jacksonville, he's not going to Oakland, where you, there are, it's such a disaster there on the field that to have that extra Can't media stuff that. on top of it, I mean, that's just going to completely derail your season, you right? Know, I mean, what, the what, publicity what, here has been intense for sure, but I, and I mean, it's a tricky road I'm going down here, but I think yeah. that there are people in the NFL that have done worse things yes. than Adrian Peterson probably and played again. And I, you know, I, I don't know how big the protest would be. I don't know that it would be a massive thing. I, I think you, that I, I, don't, I, I, I think that this could go away, actually. I think there's a, a, a blueprint with, with, you know, the, the Eagles and Michael Vick, too, that you can outlast it. You, you have the show the remorse. You don't get in any more trouble. You know, we constantly stand up and, and answer whatever questions need to be answered. Yeah. And then you just, and after that, you shut up and play. Do community service. Yeah, you have to spin it into um, 
a, a chance to spin a very bad thing into a good thing in terms of being an activist um, like Michael Vick has uh, to some extent after the dog fighting suspension and um, a chance to spin it into a good thing. Right. Okay. Well, speaking of good things and good play, the Wizards are 7-2 and two starting the season. Bradley Beal practiced for the first time since uh, breaking his left hand and I saw him shooting a couple days ago. He looked good. I mean, he looked, he looked energetic. He, looked, he was getting up and down the court. He was catching the ball with his left hand. So my question for you, Scott, is, is with the way the Wizards are playing now, is there any chance that he, when he comes back, there's a little, the chemistry is disrupted with how well they're playing now? I could see maybe a hiccup for a couple games yeah. as Randy Whitman kind of figures out the rotation and gets Bradley Beal back into, into game shape. But I think his, his return is going to be nothing but good for a, for a Wizards team that has benefited from a, a relatively weak schedule to start the season, Bill yep. patting that record a bit. Um, the three-point shooting, something that they excelled in last year. I think they finished fourth in three-point uh, field goal percentage this year. They've, they've struggled. Garrett Temple has tried to fill the void. John Wall. Yeah. But Beal really able to stretch that offense with the inside game they already have is going to be nothing but a good thing. Heath, is there, are, are you easing are Beal back or are you getting him 30 minutes a game right off the bat? I, I would say ease him back in, to be honest with you. Yeah. And I don't think it matters if it disrupts the chemistry because yeah. this, this team is thinking big picture already. Right, the, the idea for this team is to advance in the playoffs, maybe get to the conference finals or the finals. And, and, you know, whether it disrupts the chemistry for four or five games is, is not a big deal. The thing that would worry me most about Beal is uh, there was the, the quote today in, in Jorge Castillo's story yeah. about how Beal said, you know, the only time he feels pain is, is when there's contact. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and that would worry me, the, the chance of re-injuring it. So I think you do ease him back in. Dan, if you're Randy Whitman, are you starting Beal or are you bringing him slowly off the bench? I think I would probably start him off the bench yeah. as long as Beal's cool with that. And, you know... I mean, one of the one of the reasons that I don't think you want to rush his minutes is because he, probably he's taking some minutes away from Otto Porter at some mm -hmm. point. And I love I love how much time Otto Porter is getting right now, and yeah. I love what he's doing for the team. And yeah. I, I mean, I think to the extent that you can get him as much as experience right now when they're playing these kind of meaningless games against these kind of bad teams, I think that's better for Otto. And you're going to have Beal for 60 games, and you're going to have him for the playoffs. I, there's no need for him to be playing 30 minutes a game now. Well, is, is, do you think it's reasonable that he comes back not against Dallas on Wednesday, but against the Cavaliers, Keith, on Friday? That's a huge game, obviously, right? Well, yeah, and, and it's certainly one you want to be in. You, you want to be in front of the crowd because it's probably right. going to be a packed house for that one. A yeah. being a Friday night and, and it yeah. being LeBron. Yeah. Um, the ESPN game too. The ESPN game, yeah. yeah. But but you know the you just can't lose sight of what's important. What's important is getting Beal back into the flow, getting this team play. You know, keeping this team playing well. Uh, you know, going forward, uh, I, I don't know if I would mince or, or over be too too focused on how well he plays right away out yeah. of the gate. How you know if it disrupts the chemistry. I, I think that the big thing is is long term. And that Cleveland game, you know, we were talking before the season started, all the best backcourt in the NBA stuff. If, yeah, um, right. that's sort of. <laughs> Sort of got buried in <laughs> yeah. under the Cleveland trying to figure out whether they could actually win a game, and now they're now they're cruising. But I, that that debate seems to have just kind of yeah. Scott. Out. Are you does it concern you at all that if Beal comes in and takes away time from Otto, that you know it, it's going to Otto's not going to be able to get into the rhythm he has been, and that's going to kind of take his game back a notch? I'm not too concerned, yeah. just because we're only nine games into the season. Yeah. I mean, you see some coaches take the full 82 games to figure out that rotation come playoff time, and as Keith and Dan have both mentioned, I think that's where the eyes are now. I mean, you've got 70 games left to figure out what the rotation should be. I mean, I think another interesting thing at, at some point besides the playoff thing for this Wizards team will be honestly whether they can set a franchise mark for regular season wins or at least, you know, the, the most in 30 years. I think that's going to be interesting because they certainly have the talent to do that. Well, you mentioned playoffs, Dan, and that leads us to our next team, the Washington Capitals, who we know it's all about the postseason for them. They've won President's Cups, have done nothing with it. They've been a top seed, top cup, and they've done nothing with that either. So they've been up and down this season, right? So they've had, they've lost five in a row. They won three in a row. Now they're in a little slot here, two in a row. It's about a quarter of the way through the season, they're three points out of the final playoff spot in the Eastern Conference. Dan, are, is, that, is it too early to be concerned that they may not even make the playoffs this year? I mean, I think that was probably a concern entering the season. They, they certainly were never like a done deal, a shoe in to make the playoffs. Yeah. Um, you know, I guess at some point it matters a little bit what you're watching sports for. If you're only watching for the championship or if you're kind of watching <laughs> for the process a little bit. You know what I mean? Because yeah. if a team doesn't make the playoff, I mean, are we going to stop watching every team that is uh, kind of 50-50 for the playoffs or whatever? I, you know, there's, there's some kind of interest in how this team plays under trots in the first year and how some of these younger guys are playing and whether Holtby can regain his form. 
certainly in the back of your mind, I think you have to be wondering, is this a playoff team? But I think it's, in terms of like panic and getting up on the legend stuff, it's way, way, way too early for well, that. Yeah, I, I, I would say apart from the, the Redskins, there, there, there is a malaise that if, if, if the Caps and the Wizards are just blo- so-so that I don't think people are going to tune in. And they want to see, the, they're, the, the Bulls have won a championship, right? I mean, so it's happened in the city. So they want, people here want to see it again. The Caps have not done anything yeah. with, the, with the roster that's won, the, the, had the best record in the regular season. So. Yeah, but when you're playing 82 games, it's just like, you know, at some point you have to enjoy the games for what they are. They're like yeah. weird sporting events with well, men and fun. I'm sure uniforms. we'll talk about the Nationals in the same way next year. But yeah. back to the Caps, Keith, your thoughts. I mean, is it too early to think this team may not even be a playoff game? A playoff team. It's not too early to think it, yeah. but it's too early to worry too much about it. Dan hit on a good thing, the word of the process. Yeah. Remember that you, you've hired an established coach, guy who was, who was the coach for 15 years in Nashville. He has a way of doing things, and he's here, not unlike sure. Jay Gruden, to yeah. establish a culture, to, change, to, to turn this from what had sort of gotten, gotten away under uh, Adam Oates, turn this in, into his style of team. And so you see him tinkering with the lines, and you see, you see him experimenting in these uh, first you know, 15, 20 games right now, they're what, 17 games in at this point. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't panic. You, you certainly, at some point, you want to see signs of them going in the right direction, but, but you, this is not time necessarily to worry about whether they are or aren't going to make the playoffs. Scott, they've been inconsistent this year. Is that a concern that you, you have to have that consistency to be a playoff team, or are you not worried because it's too early in the season? I think it's too early to stress out about yeah. the point totals and the standings. You yeah. see so many teams bunched around that eighth spot. Yeah. I mean, they win a couple games, and all of a sudden we're talking about whether or not they can secure the three seed in the playoffs. And then they lose two, and we're talking about whether they're not going to make the playoffs at all. The more concerning thing for me is um, Barry Trotz kind of blowing up a couple weeks ago after the 6-5 loss to Arizona, right. um, talking about the behavior issues. And then kind of an update today from, from Alex Pruitt, you know, he says that you know, some of those behavior issues are gone, but we're still acting like we're trying to build Rome in a day, and there's some <laughs> twists and turns. And we've seen it, win a couple, play really well, lose a couple. Yeah. Um, they've been up and down, and the, the record shows it. Um, and I would hope that, like Keith said, it's a process, and that once they adjust to this system, that they can get on a roll here in December. Okay. I think a, w- a big long-term question is going to be whether Holpe is, is what we yeah. thought he was before the season or whether he is what he's been so far this season, which has not been good. Guys, on to uh, some college hoops. Uh, great start this weekend for all the locals. GW 2-0, Maryland two, uh, two, uh, two, 2-0, Virginia 2-0, G- and the Hoyas play tonight. They won first game on Saturday against the uh, NCAA tournament team. So which one of these four teams are you most encouraged by? At this point, he's obviously so, so early. But, Dan, do you have one, anyone stand out to you? I'm going to take maybe the unusual one and saying Maryland because yeah. I think that GW, I mean, great road win for GW, but I think that, you know, GW, Georgetown, and Virginia, we all probably thought were tournament teams. Maryland, less certain about. They played two home games against not good teams, but they blew them out. They, they ran them off the floor. And that's yeah. something that, honestly, they haven't really been able to do under Mark Turgeon. They haven't been able to blow out bad teams or good teams or any teams. And so they're looking, I mean, they're looking like a Big Ten team should look against bad teams at home, and that's something I don't think was uh, we could have taken for granted. It's also encouraging, I think, if you're Turgeon, that Evan Sumatra's when you're starting players is, is out, and you still look pretty good. Right. And it was interesting. They're starting rotation. They didn't use Amante Dodd. He went small in, in the first game, and that, and that worked too. A good bit of coaching there from Turge. But Keith, any of those four teams set up particularly to you? Yeah, I, I would have said Maryland as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, really? I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's fine. You know, we didn't. We didn't. Yeah, that's, that's fine. Sorry, we didn't coordinate yeah, before yeah, the yeah. show. We don't have to. <laughs> um, no, I, I think you know, and the reason is for much the reasons that 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 Dan said. That's the the team where you have the most question marks, where you you wonder what kind of team they're going to be, and all signs point to good so far. You know, you're only beating Wagner and Central Connecticut State, but but as you said, you know, you you uh, you beat them pretty handily. I think Maryland probably is going to define itself during the Big Ten season, mm-hmm. so we don't get too excited about anything that happens in the first 10 or 11 games, but, yeah. but, uh, but certainly a good start. Scott, are you with these guys about Maryland, or are you looking at another team? I'll, I'll, go, I'll go with Georgetown. Okay. Um, I think a, a good win against St. Francis yeah. and LJ Peak, one of the best freshman debuts probably the best for freshman Georgetown. Debut, yes. Nine for nine. Nine for nine. 23 points. Yeah. And until that point, most people probably remember him as the guy who threw the South Carolina oh, hat yeah, on, his signing on the day. ground That's on right. his signing day. But him and Josh Smith, I mean, who I remember from his days at UCLA, he's got the weight down a little bit. Yep. He was kind of almost responsible for their, the tailspin um, that they went into last sure. year. Yep. If he can stay academically eligible and, and 
keep his weight down. <laughs> and LJP can continue to develop. I think Georgetown can, uh, can do some. Well, you know, John Thompson the third was none too pleased with the way Joshua Smith played in that first game. I don't know if you saw what he said afterward, but he said, we asked him about it, and he said it was unacceptable, which to me says he's getting close to having it up to here with that, with that guy. I mean, 10 points. He had at halftime. Two two, how does that happen? Two rebounds, and you're 6'10", 350 pounds. You should just, it should, it should, 10 rebounds, just, at least five should just <laughs> fall in your hand by accident, right? But huge game coming up between GW and, and Virginia. Which team, Dan, would you say that's more important for to win? Oh, clearly, I think for GW. They okay. don't get... I mean, first of all, it would be on the road. It would be a huge road where they've already got one yeah. world win. But they just they get a fewer number of uh, chances to define themselves with big wins like that than Virginia They beat top 20 teams last year, though, too. You know, they were to start 17-3. and three. That would be to, to beat, but to beat a top 10 team this early in the season after coming off uh, losing two of your best players, yeah, I think that would be a huge, a huge win for the Colonials. Um, do, you, do you see GW as a team, that Keith, that can challenge Virginia? And it's on the road, it's in Charlottesville. Is that a game that they can go down there and win? You know, I think that's, that's the fun of these games yeah. early in the season. Those, those teams define themselves. You don't really know uh, at, at this point. You know, that, that's, I think that's why we, we like these early season games. That's a not answer. It is it's, a not answer. It's, it is. <laughs> well, on, on that not answer, well, we're going to have to uh, cut the show off today. But, guys, thanks for joining me in studio. We have a lot to talk about with the Redskins, as we do every week. Um, we'll see some of you here next week. I'm Gene Wong. Thanks for watching Post Sports Live.